Hello and welcome to the Maidcast, the official podcast of the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, a series of lectures on video game history as a part of the Maid's ongoing effort to preserve history through teaching and displaying playable exhibits of rare games and consoles. While life in the COVID has forced us to close our doors, the support of people like you has allowed us to continue to bring history to you through lectures like the one you'll hear in a few minutes. I'm Chen. I'm Red. I'm Anthony. And I'm Miles. This week, we have Dan Xu on the podcast to talk about his time as editor-in-chief at EGM Magazine and his experience with games journalism in general. This should be a very exciting podcast to talk about and getting into that section of the games world because there's been some controversies around games journalism in the past and the present and just how how people deal with them but mm-hmm. it'll be it's a very interesting interview and I think you all will enjoy it but first we have some little bit of news to get into at the start we have Pokemon Snap reviews are getting kind of mixed messages a little iffy there's a lot of people that really enjoy it there is a lot of people that are unsure whether it is worth the sixty dollar price tag, but oh, I think overall it's cons- it's been considered like a good launch. People seem to be enjoying it. They've definitely upgraded the visuals and made it like an HD picture making world. And I did get a chance to play it a little bit last week, so I would highly recommend, highly recommend checking it out. It's a really fun experience, nice and peaceful if not a bit hand-holdy at times with the tutorials, but mm-hmm. that is just a personal gripe that I have with many newer games in general that try to appeal to everybody. But, I don't know, I, I like games that are like puzzles that you can kind of freeform your own way, just kind of, you're given a set of things to do, and then you can figure out what those things can do in tandem throughout the playing of the game, rather than everything being so rail locked hand holdy it's like oh you do this with this and then you take a picture with this button oh and then you move the camera around with this joystick all while locking you out of doing anything else so you can only do that while they let you know well you know it's the pokemon thing it's um every pokemon game that comes out for the first like 20 minutes to two hours to three hours sometimes you're you're locked into a tutorial that teaches you how to play a game you already know how to play yeah it would be very nice if they had a skip tutorial thing. Mm-hmm. Something that, like, for people who are experienced, couldn't just kind of move ahead and not address. But I don't know. I think that's just Pokemon in general. I think new Pokemon games, people think that, oh, this is a new Pokemon game. No other previous Pokemon fan is going to play this game. So we need to make sure it's evidently clear of what this game is and what to do about it. Has it has been mm-hmm. a while since this game was first out, so I think it's actually quite reasonable. Uh, very true. I, I mean, it is quite reasonable. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I, it'll be interesting to see the level of... It'll be very interesting to see the level of handhold with uh, Pokemon Legends Arceus. But I think it's enough about Pokemon right now. In we some have... serious... Uh, Tonal whiplash. A little, uh, just a little bit. Just a little, little bit, bit of a, you know, uh, one, 180 degree pivot. Uh, um, from games for kids to uh, games for people who hate kids. Like being afraid. <laughs> uh, Resident Evil 8 is now out and it is getting pretty good reviews. I've seen a bit of it played. Uh, I've never been really a Resident Evil person, but they all look fun. Um, yes. And this one is heavily leaning into sort of the gothic horror vibe. Like, there's vampires, there's werewolf people, there's Lady gargoyles, Dimitrescu. some kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, it's very goth-heavy, but it's very it's good. It's really good. Yeah, the the aesthetic on Resident Evil games, uh, as a, from 7 to 8, 7 was kind of more of like a, a rural rundown household, which was like almost a, almost Texas Chainsaw vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one definitely is going a little bit kind of uh, like ethereal dark not not real dark so it goes back to it's... sort of the resident evil one vibe with just the big spooky manor yes and i think that that is and it's just I a think huge that is, maze that is a smart move and that they can do a lot in that environment especially just with the with the advancement of the capabilities of systems and what you can do in these types of games now but We'll talk more about Resident Evil 8 in the future because that, that, I think that'll be a good game for us to continue to talk about. But one little quick thing before that as well. Uh, Fortnite 
uh, the Epic and Apple trial has been delayed just for a second because children have made calls to their senators to stop this trial um, or to no, not to stop it, but to free Fortnite. Um, so uh, during, I'm very glad that kids can stop playing Fortnite enough to <laughs> delay a trial and voice their support, such as the democratic process. <laughs> really, the lesson to take away from the the, t- the lesson to take away from this is to always watch your settings when you start a Zoom yeah. call. Yeah, very, very Make true. sure that people can't join. Yeah. Make sure that make people sure that, can't call in. Yeah, make sure that random people can't. But, I mean, that's another, that's another issue with uh, technologically literate people uh, in power that we can... Might be for another podcast, but... <laughs> but I think it's about time we throw this over to Alex and Dan Shu. Hello, and I am here with Dan Shu. Welcome, Dan. Hey, thanks for having me, Alex. So excited to have you here. Uh, I want to talk about magazines. Dan, you were the, the unfortunately, the final editor at EGM, right? But I mean, it was a much longer career than just the finality, but... Uh... Uh, well, actually, no, they're, they're... So I left around 2008 if I'm not mistaken, 2007, 2008, around that time period. Uh, and there were people who continued the magazine for a little while after me, and then they got sold uh, in exchange ownership for a few uh, years, and it was still running for a little while after I left. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was not familiar. I'm, I, I I feel terrible at besmirching the great name of EGM because it was such an, a fundamental part of the society of uh, gamers and games history. I, I frequently pull out the... 100 or 300 page issues from the 90s to show people Mm -hmm. how influencing influential these magazines were why don't you tell us how you got into that side of the industry well actually uh so back in the this is the mid 90s uh and i was a big big video gamer i used to be a regular egm and next gen magazine reader myself uh i occasionally pick up other magazines like game fan and game informer and such but um at the time my ex like i didn't know what i wanted to do out of college and then my ex at the time said well why don't you just apply at companies you'd like to work for versus in industries you're supposed to work at you know looking at your (laughs) degree and stuff so i'm like and i'd love to get into video games somehow so i sent out my resume to about 30 different companies and then uh and no one wrote back right i didn't have any Mm -hmm. right experience i was just like just slinging mud against the wall and seeing what sticks what was your degree in statistics Ah. Yeah, so nothing to do with <laughs> writing or journalism, anything like that. That's so funny. Today, they'd be killing to get you in there with a <laughs> statistics degree anywhere. Yeah, but uh, well, I don't even know that. So I haven't used statistics since then, you know. So, yeah, and then uh, like nine months later, I get a call from the editorial director, uh, Joe Funk um, of EGM, and he liked my cover letter, of all things. Like, <laughs> I didn't apply to be a writer. Uh, I didn't say I want to be on the review crew, anything like that. And then he just... Uh, he liked my writing and he said, can you send me more samples? So I did uh, fax them in, you know, <laughs> and then um, they, they called me in for an interview. I drove down to Chicago because I was living in Michigan at the time and then did the interview. They offered me the job and I was blown away because I'm walking into this office. People have TVs and uh, Super Nintendos and Sega Genesis systems and PlayStation ones on their on their desks. And I'm like, I can't believe this is a work environment, right? This is where people work. And then they wanted <laughs> me to be one of the reviewers uh, for sort of like uh, they're going through some changes and they wanted to kind of uh, upgrade the writing in the magazine. And my writing just seemed to fit along with a few other guys like Crispin Boyer and Sean Smith. That's crazy. And uh, I mean, what did it feel? I mean, this was your first co- job out of college is like. Almost. I, and so I worked at like enterprise rent a car like i was going through their manager <laughs> trainee system and that was uh not what i wanted to do. i didn't know what i wanted to do but yeah That's this is my first i would say more legit job uh more wow, permanent like, job what a choice right like right out of college do i go on to be a manager of car rentals or do i go play video games for a living <laughs> yeah no kidding like uh i'm super thing i got lucky uh the timing was right i was lucky i spent some time on that cover letter and made sure it was good uh, so a lot of things fell into place. I was also lucky Joe Funk took a chance on me, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this unproven guy who didn't have a degree or background in writing. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of, I, I'm super, super fortunate. I get to work in this business. 
That's really funny. I got my first job at a uh, Mac Home Journal from the cover letter alone. They just liked oh, yeah. the writing. I mean, if they're going to hire a writer and they write a good cover letter, I guess that sort of speaks volumes, right? Yeah. It, it, the, and when I was uh, more, I was the, like the editor and I was running the magazine and I was looking at applicants and hiring people myself, the cover letter to me was more important than the resume because uh, I could give you a couple of funny stories there, but uh, for the cover letter side, I'm like, if you didn't catch my attention or you didn't kind of draw me in or make, this wasn't interesting. And even if there's literally, if there's one typo, I immediately threw it out because <laughs> my attitude was, if this is going to be the first thing you put together to try and press uh, a magazine or some editors, and you're not careful enough to catch a mistake, then how will you be in your day-to-day -day job, right? When you have deadlines and you're rushing your work a little bit more. So uh, one typo was like, nope, that's it. I don't care how great the letter is. Otherwise, the, that was a no-go for me. But I, oh, I liked yeah. it better than a resume because we've had applicants that um, had great resumes and they don't know what they're doing. Like uh, we had this story where we had this applicant came in. Um, he wanted to be a writer for the magazine. And he worked at some newspapers. And uh, man, it was awful because it was, I felt it was cringy because he didn't know how to hold the controller properly. <laughs> we we do these tests, right, at EGM. Like, I had to do this test when I applied to prove that I know how to play video. So I had to sit down with an editor. And I, at the time, I played Alien Trilogy on a PS1. And okay. so, but we brought in other editors and they would sit with us, or uh, other applicants, they would sit with us uh, and they would try to play some games. And we had this one guy, he's like, he try he didn't understand he was trying to play Ridge Racer and on oh. a PlayStation 1, and then he's we we're showing him the controls, and then he's like, well, how do you steer and accelerate at the same time? And we're looking at him. It's because he put both hands on the left side of the controller, <laughs> left thumb on the left D-pad, right thumb on a right D-pad. So <laughs> with both his hands tied up on the left side of the controller, he had no hands left and no fingers left for any buttons on the right side of the controller. Uh, and we're like... Okay, this guy doesn't know how to play video games, but yeah. <laughs> we want we kind of wanted to see what would happen anyways. That's kind of shocking to think you had to like test to see if people knew how to play video games back in the day. Like today, could you imagine like would you ever test? You'd just be like, "Of course this person knows how to play video games." Yeah, we kind of stopped after a while because it was kind of a given and and games had become more mainstream, but um it was a legit thing. Like we like this example uh really like help, helped us vet this one person whose like credentials were great otherwise, but yeah, thank God we did the test because this guy didn't know video games from anything. Now I have a personal question about the offices in Illinois. We, we both worked for Ziff Davis uh, for a time there. Mm -hmm. And so in the office in San Francisco, we had a library of PC games on site and it was magnificent. Did you guys have the same thing out there in, in uh, Illinois? Yeah. And then even we brought it with us when we moved to San Francisco as well, but we had a backlog, but the, the one in, Illinois was fantastic because it had like this closet full of different ROMs of old cartridge games. Like, so sometimes when companies would send us games for preview and this mm. predates even me being there, uh, you would get uh, just the, the basic insides of a cartridge. Right. And then, so when you plug it into your super Nintendo or your Sega Genesis, you just have these chips and this motherboard looking thing uh, just kind of sticking out of it. And it felt you know, there's a, these sharp bits on the underside of these boards, and uh, it felt really iffy. And you, I always kind of was nervous about these things because it felt like they could break or you could <laughs> handle it incorrectly. But they had a giant room full of these things, including unreleased products. Like we we played games that never came to fruition and never actually got released. And uh, a million uh, collectors just went to Illinois on the word of you saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder what happened to all that stuff. I know that. I think the stuff out in San Francisco was donated to somebody prominent. So they were, I think they were donated to the right place. Anyway, uh, we're, I'm rat holing on museum stuff. I wanted you to be able to tell that story we started up telling here about uh, the leak and how people would leak from the magazine. Yeah. So, yeah, you and I were talking before we started recording and we, um, you were saying like, oh, yeah, back in the magazine days, things didn't leak so much. I'm like, oh, they, they definitely did. And that became... Uh, really tough to work around. In fact, it just got worse and worse. So, uh, when you so putting together a magazine, you have to imagine the monthly times were a month to two months, uh, because we had to all 
put together the content. We before plan after planning the content, we put together the content, we lay out the pages, the designers are like putting writers are writing words, designers are putting pictures in and laying out the magazine. And then we put together final files. We go through several editing passes, several checks, pagination, all of this kind of stuff. Then run a book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, We deliver these files. You have to get them to a printer by a certain date because they have you slotted in to print at a certain date so that the magazines are created, then given to distributors and put on trucks and delivered around the world uh, by a certain date to get into stores by a certain date. So it's all very carefully planned out uh, months in advance. Uh, But the thing is, so if we get an exclusive, we're just like praying that in that entire time, nothing leaks before the s- magazines hit the stores. But that is almost impossible because it could, a, a small leak would be uh, someone working at an electronics boutique who, when they, as soon as the magazines come in, they open it up and they start taking pictures and posting them online before they even put them on the store shelves, right? That's one example. Another the example I was telling you about was uh, there were people at the printer uh, who were gamers who realized like, oh my God, this is the first look of the new Halo or the new GTA. And then they would take pictures and put them on NeoGAF. And then from the proofs, right? From from paper proofs that eventually turn into magazine pages. So we, this funny story was one time we had a leak. I think it was Halo 3. And it's like, ugh, but we saw the pictures and there were photo, cell phone photographs of these paper proofs. So we're like, okay, the leak came from the printer. We know this is the only place that this came from. So we contacted the printer. They don't want this stuff going on because this is bad for business, right? So they hired a private investigator to go and snoop and figure out uh, who did this. And eventually they caught the guy and the, the investigator went and confronted this guy, like out, I think is at a restaurant or a coffee shop or something like that, huh. and basically busted him and then uh, fired him on the spot for leaking confidential information. Wow. But this this touches on sort of the interesting thing about, you know, quote unquote, games journalism is that it is when it's really giving the people exactly what they want. It's it's sort of piecemealed out by the company in this very managed fashion. And yet that's kind of what people slather over, right? The new information on the new game. But as you and I both know, all every time you do a preview in one of these magazines, like you're sitting in a room with those people in their offices in a very controlled situation playing or seeing or being told these things. Right. It's not. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's a nominally journalistic endeavor to do these preview things. It's literally just taking information from the makers and bringing it to the public. Yeah, right. I don't. I, so people used to call us like game journalists, and I think that journalism is a specific maybe subset of content creation and editorializing uh, content. Because if you're doing a cover story, you're absolutely right. You didn't investigate that you didn't maybe leak it or got to the company and stole these somehow right or (laughs) someone leaked these assets to you uh you didn't investigate these you worked with that company uh and you're like okay we'd like to get this exclusive and then you kind of talk about what you would like to do with it maybe maybe they like either your it's usually your reach right of how many consumers you can reach uh Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's your magazine's reputation because that's the impact it's like prestigious for them to be able to debut games on certain magazines and certain platforms right they Mm -hmm. they care Mm -hmm. about that not just getting it out there first so the reach the prestige and the reputation of the outlet and also what they want to do with that you know like sometimes it's it comes down to like hey are these people gamers and they're passionate about the subject matter right like they they kind of want their franchise in good hands like people they want positive coverage right but of course uh, they they want to give this content and this coverage to a magazine or an outlet they think will take care of that franchise and make it look as good as possible so they want to share with passionate people either people are passionate about the franchise or about the genre and so on uh so all those things different uh come into play in terms of getting your exclusive but journalism, I think, is a separate set. Like we had journalists on staff too, who were like, "All right, they're they're chasing down leads, they're investigating stories, or chasing mm-hmm. down rumors and things like that." So I think that's definitely a different type of content. Absolutely, and that that's that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, the idea of games, quote unquote, journalism, it's just be journalism that happens to cover gaming is really what mm-hmm. we're, I think. We're, anyway, uh, but there there always was that fine line, right? Like the the reviews are the things that they're always. The publishers are screaming about and really want the control over. They can't have the control over the reviews, but the previews are the place where they can dangle the carrot in front of these outlets and and get sort of what they want, right? Like uh, anyway, it's an interesting dynamic. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on sort of 
I mean, the period that you were at EGM was sort of down with magazines or going down, right? Like, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'd say so. Is like, and that's one of the reasons I left actually was, um, so Zip Davis, you know, the parent company, mm -hmm. they had several magazines like Games for Windows magazine, the official mm -hmm. PlayStation magazine, Xbox Nation, EGM, and so on. And then it has some online properties like oneup.com, gamevideos.com, but we did I, I remember specifically like i did this one promotion i worked with uh our promotions team and i said hey what if we did a giveaway uh of some i think it's like some all the different new consoles at the time and also a bunch of games and controllers and things like that and the return was fantastic like we gained x I, you know this is a long time ago but we gained a bunch of subscribers and the cost it took us to run this promotion and to buy the prizes uh was way way nothing compared to what we gained in revenue so that was a clear win uh then i'm like about a year later i wanted to do something similar i'm like okay we already have proof of concept we know this is going to work it just it just makes money for us but they didn't want to make that investment and uh, mm. you can already see like okay magazines are where they want to invest and which is mm -hmm. the correct move right i understand it's just uh yeah it's not the place to invest but at the same time I didn't see Zip Davis necessarily investing properly in our online properties as well. So I'm like, all right, if I'm not sure I want to continue working on at this place, if we're like, okay, I'm working at a old format that's like slowly going downhill and we're not investing into the future. So, and, yeah. and at, by that point, I've been doing media for 17, 18 years. And I needed a bit of a change uh, of like, I wanted to try something on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Ziff Davis's whole thing was that they they spun off all the good stuff back in the late '90s, right? Like yeah. CNET and uh, Tech TV, and then they kept the magazines. And we were always trying to relaunch websites again. I don't know. We had some kind of agreement that we couldn't. I, it was so weird. Mm -hmm. I remember trying to get stuff posted from CGW on Gamespot's website because they were supposed to be our website, even though they didn't belong to us anymore. Yeah, it was very strange. Uh, well, what do you miss the most about the the media side, though? I and mean, now that you're on the publisher side. If you're okay with mentioning where you work. Yeah, I work at Blue. So after I left um, EGM, I took about a year off. I just did some like blogging on the side with my friend Crispin Boyer from EGM. And uh, we, after that, I founded a company called Bitmob with uh, my other friend, Damien Lin, who also uh, ex-EGM, ex-EGM alumni. And then, um, so we did Bitmob for a couple of years. Then we didn't really have the business background to run it. We just had the editorial chops, and I think that was it. So it it did well, um, but we we couldn't really keep it as a business business. So then we sold it to VentureBeat. Then I went back to media for a couple of years, and then after that, I went to uh, PlayStation to do third party marketing for mm. PlayStation for about four years. And today I'm at Blizzard uh, doing content programming for Blizzard. So that, I've also made the switch to corporate content from being, you know, in, in magazines and print. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the different, just the workflow and the day to day. Yeah, like I mean, back in the magazine business, right? It was really fun. It was creative because you're you're spending time, like, okay, what are we gonna do this month? What's gonna be the cover story? What are gonna be the features? What games are we previewing? And different people would be responsible for different sections of the magazine. Right? We had a news editor, previews editor, reviews editor, uh, and so that was a lot of fun. And you had the the cadence was such of like and this wasn't necessarily good we didn't do a good job with this but we would uh like okay build up slowly towards deadline it gets busier and busier and then the week of deadline it's like a lot of late nights overnights sometimes sleeping at the office trying to get all the work done because you have all these pages to fill and you, you've got to fill them you can't have blank pages mm -hmm. so then uh as soon as deadline was over then it's like, okay, you're you're celebrating for a bit. You just had to wind down. And then you're just kind of taking it easy for about a week because yeah. you're just burnt <laughs> out, right? You can't burn yeah. yourself out. And yeah. then you're just taking it easy and playing games a lot in the office and relaxing. And then you're in that cycle again because like, well, we just lost a week out of next month. And now, we have, yep. now we're on short and we had two and a half, three weeks to get the magazine put together again. So, um, but what I loved about it was having that long lead time to work on really cool ideas and features, you know, like... Um, I remember, for example, one of my favorite ideas was when uh, I think it was GTA. It must have been Grand Theft Auto 4. And that was taking place in a likeness of New York City. And they used a lot of New York City as sort of like the, the inspiration mm -hmm. for 
Liberty City. And then so what we did was uh, we saw some of the screenshots were like, you could see part where this is coming from, from New York. So we hired a photographer, gave him the screenshots and said, go scout these locations, a photographer that knew New York really well. And like, go take these pictures of these things, like the subway system, the brownstones, uh, the coastline and the city skyline and all these different places. And so we can match them up and show like, here's the screenshot, here's the real life equivalent. That mm -hmm. stuff takes time, right? And then uh, you could do stuff like that in the magazine business. But in the online world, it's all about, you got to be quick, you got to be mm -hmm. first. Is Being first is more important than being accurate or good. And mm -hmm. that's another reason why I've kind of got tired of doing traditional media was like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I'm not rewarded for doing great work. I'm rewarded mm -hmm. for doing it fast. And even it's better if you're, it's better for the business if you're fast and mm -hmm. inaccurate and then you fix it later because you already got the traffic, you already got the SEO juice, you already got the social media shares. Uh, so I didn't really like working in that world so much. It was just like, yeah, I, I want to do good work that I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. um, but on a publisher side, the difference is now, things might take a long time to get approved. You sometimes are competing with media, right? Because it's like, hey, do we want to give this story idea to an IGN or a Polygon, or do you want to keep it in-house? And then trying to work with the different brand teams and different uh, uh, commercial groups to try to figure all that stuff out. Uh, it's, a, it's a different world, but it's also great because you have inside access. You learn about things way before the media does. Uh, you need know, to keep that stuff a secret, but then you can start to plan like, oh, what if we did this idea or you did this idea? So uh, I've always kind of liked that. Um, I was, I'm like, this is a good sort of path for me, like in a post independent media world is to work on a publisher to get the inside access and to work. It's also a more stable environment, you know, it, and it pays better than media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's just a, it's a more stable world. I think as I get older, I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't know if I want to do the whole late night work, working on uh, sleeping under my desk sort of lifestyle anymore. And mm -hmm. I want more responsibilities and bigger responsibilities. Yeah. 100% agreed on the uh, compensation being a lot better. Uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you the thing that I miss the most is editorial meetings. They were the best. Mm -hmm. Nothing like being in a room full of people who everybody knows everything there is about the subject you're all discussing. And you're like watching the train wrecks unfold and commenting. On them. <laughs> and... Yeah. Oh man. We used to have, my favorite meetings were when like that, they're, they're more like uh, one shots versus like weekly meetings or whatever. But we used to have um, big meetings to figure out, okay, we're going to do the top 100 games of all time. Oh, oh man. So much fun. It's, a, oh, it's yeah. a lot. So everyone's in a room. We know mm -hmm. we're going to stay late. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be, okay, let's order food and we're going to sit here and argue. And then people are going to throw out ideas and then they're going to argue like, oh yeah, that game was great. And we're like, no, that game is. Oops, sorry. I don't know if I'm it's supposed okay. To swear. You're not the uh, first. <laughs> uh, and then a lot of arguments about what's good, what's not. Was it good at the time? Is it still good today? There are a lot of challenges of like, mm. I dare you to play that game today and still think it's really good uh, by today's standards. And trying to figure out what order things go in. And then when you get to the number one game of all time, a oh. uh, lot of arguments about that. But it, there, that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun. Absolutely. The, you're absolutely right. Those are. Just having all those involved people who just have that lexicographical knowledge of everything, mm -hmm. arguing for hours, <laughs> like we were, we were here to argue for hours. That yeah. is amazing. It's like having a like a forum message board kind of conversation, but with mature people who know, like, okay, what we're going to produce at the end is an awesome list that the readers are going to enjoy. Exactly, exactly. Well, Dan, thank you so much for being here. We've had a wonderful time talking to you. Hopefully, we can get you back and get some of the other EGMers in here. All right, thanks for having me, Alex. Thank you very much, Dan, for your time and giving us a, a bit of insight into the journalism world uh, for games and what it was like back in the day and mm -hmm. how you got into the industry. We're very, very thankful to have you on and we'll hopefully have you on again in the future. But now I think it is time for us to wrap up a little bit in personal news. What have you guys been playing? Well, I'm still going through Hollow Knight. Uh, it's still hard. It's still really good. It's, it's still good. Yeah. I was going to say, it was like, it's still hard. It's still good. Yeah. Uh, I recently just started playing, uh, a game with my friends called Vermintide 2, mm. uh, which is essentially Left 4 Dead, but in the Warhammer universe. Ooh. Uh, it's okay. a lot of fun. It's extremely gory. 
Um, yeah. Very hectic. We have a great time with it. Awesome. I, I'll i definitely have to check that one out because I really like it. The Left 4 Dead series was really something that tickled me pretty well. Mm -hmm. Anything new that y'all have been playing? Nope, I haven't been playing much. Well, it is finals week, so yeah, it's understandable, and life gets in the way. I, other than going on going out of town last week and playing Pokemon Snap, I honestly haven't been playing much of anything other than that mm -hmm. either. But life sometimes happens. I'm doing okay at the game of life. I got a I got a C score on the rafting trip yesterday down on the Russian River V2. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. But life games are a little bit harder. Yeah. You've got to disconnect. I now. wish I can just switch the difficulties to a little bit less than hardcore. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I also want like the game of life to have. Just give me a save button. So. Yeah, a, a save button. You know, more than one life would be nice. <laughs> like, it's, it's, uh, you know, just a little respite from everything else. But. Anyway, we have run out of time. Uh, yeah. Already? So anyway, thank you for listening to the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment's official podcast. If you've got any thoughts, questions, corrections, or general museum ideas, shoot us an email at info at themade.org. We'd like to send out a big thank you to everyone who donated recently and to our Patreon supporters who keep The Maid afloat. Uh, Patreon donors get to listen to this podcast one week before it's released on major streaming services, and we will continue that with future episodes every week. Till then, I'm Red. I'm Miles. I'm Chin. I'm Anthony. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Later, gamers. <laughs> And the non-gamers, you know, you don't have to be a gamer to listen to this. <laughs>